Welcome to the Schlagabtausch, your drum magazine in podcast format. Today, we have the privilege of talking to one of UK's most sought-after and versatile drummers, Ralph Salmons. Ralph's feel, groove and ability to push musical boundaries have made him the studio and live drummer of choice for artists, producers, composers and orchestras around the world. With a career littered with legendary names such as Paul McCartney, David Bowie, Tina Turner, Madonna, Aretha Franklin, Elton John, Bob Dylan, Michael Jackson, Sting, James Brown, Phil Collins, Stevie Wonder, Freddie Mercury, Eric Clapton, Mariah Carey, Robbie Williams, Alanis Morissette and many others, Ralph not only has a wealth of experience but also an incredibly impressive list of references. As a sought-after session drummer, Ralph has not only worked with some of the greatest musicians and producers but has also contributed to soundtracks for over 180 films including blockbusters such as Harry Potter, James Bond and Lord of the Rings. In addition to his studio work, Ralph also tours the world as a live performer and is a member of bands such as The Waterboys and Van Morrison's Band. Not only that, Ralph is also a dedicated educator and professor of percussion at prestigious institutions such as the Royal College of Music and the Guild School of Music and Drama. His passion for teaching and his expertise make him a sought-after lecturer all over the world. In today's conversation, we'll talk to Ralph about his impressive career, his experiences as a studio and live drummer, his work as an educator and much more. Let's dive into the world of Ralph Salmons and get to know his unique perspective on drumming and the music industry. Ralph, welcome to the Schlagabtausch and thank you very much for taking the time for us. Even just skimming your biography, um, it quickly comes clear that you must be very busy. Admittedly, I got a bit dizzy studying your credits. Uh, there are no less than 317 artists and bands listed that you have worked with and I strongly assume that this is by no means all of them. Apart from the recordings for soundtracks, film and series, in our introduction to this interview, our listeners have already gotten a small impression of you, but let's start at the very beginning of your timeline. Based on your credit list, you should be very old, but you were actually born in 1964, so you'll be a young 60 this year. How did your musical career begin and what influences shaped you in your early years? Uh, what was the first half of that question? <laughs> How did your musical career begin? Oh, yeah. um, oh that's, a, that's, yeah, um, very easy. I mean, my, my parents uh, were, were quite into music and they, they enjoyed taking me to um, gigs. They used to take me to some gigs in London where in the old days, uh, it was more like uh, theater type bar places and, and children were allowed to be taken there if it was like a theater. So uh, they used to go and t uh, watch jazz gigs and um, uh, various things. And I, I, I really enjoyed the music. And then I got very taken by watching the drummers. I loved the drummers. So that's how I got into it. And then, one thing led to another. Eventually, after making me learn piano for three years, which was a definite non-starter in my case, and I was, I didn't want to do it. I just wanted to play the drums. Um, they said, OK, when I was 12, they said, OK, you can have drum lessons now because you really want to do it. And they promised. Uh, they're very good parents to me because all parents of drummers are good, aren't they? Saintly, you know, very saintly people. Anyway, um, so then I just started getting lessons and that's it. That's how I started. But um, good morning, Ralph, first. Um, and when I, when I read your bio and your credit list, you're not only a drummer, you play classical percussion, you play timpani, and so you have a wide array of the uh, um, meaning of drums, right? You play a lot of different stuff. I did. I studied classical and timpani. Oh, Basically, okay. probably, I would say, like, um, probably about the last 20 years, um, I don't... Uh, I only do that sort of stuff like in the studio. Maybe I've done it on movie scores um, and then sometimes if there's drum and, um, drums and percussion together. But um, the thing is with, with the classical uh, style of playing, um, if you're not doing, like anything really, like drums, if you're not doing it all the time, uh, you lose the touch, you lose the feel. So 
although I've I've got you know certain disciplines that I can I can play in time I can play to clicks and all of that uh, just hopefully um, you, you you know going at the back of an orchestra used to be easy for me and um, it, you know it can very easily be a terrifying thing so what people used to do is say, oh, come and play some drums with an orchestra. And then, oh yeah, come. we need a bit of percussion too on this stuff, you know. And I used to agree to do it, but I, I don't agree to do it anymore because it's, it's a different thing. But I trained in that, I studied it, and it was a fantastic thing to do. I appreciate it. And I think the knowledge that that gave me um, has led to me being able to work with orchestras, um, anywhere where there's a conductor involved, sometimes slightly, perhaps more complicated music, but um, not that complicated. You know, uh, we're not talking Frank Zappa, but I've, I've done a few things like that, uh, like Mark Anthony Turnage, Blood on the Floor, things like that. Um, think, uh, things that it takes me two weeks to learn, and a symphony orchestra will probably sight read it in in uh, five minutes uh, but anyway <laughs> it did teach me a lot more of those different skills well i, I was really impressed because i, I was um, stalking you a little bit <laughs> i should be so lucky <laughs> and uh, i i mean I, i know you for a long time as a drummer but in the beginning not the name i know artists where you played and later on um i i um well i, I got your name got familiar And and for me, it was very impressive to see you like doing those movie scores. You had like five different drummers there, uh, um, and you were playing uh, timpani, or you were playing snare, or you were playing uh, like like in a percussion ensemble. And actually, this helped me in my use to get to play with a conductor, because this is actually what what I think. If um, classical is of course classical is on a click, but still you have a conductor. And sometimes it's a mix between because violins are not so fast as the drums or whatever. Uh, I think it's it's very challenging. I was really impressed by all your stuff you have done. So for me, it's, oh, thank you. It's it's really chapeau, well, chapeau. You, you are so kind. Honestly, the thing that I've done, uh, I I feel like the, the luckiest guy in the world. Um, I I play some drums. I've got very limited ability, but I I can do certain things okay um, and uh, probably I've had a you know a broad experience in terms of styles uh, I like lots of different styles and uh, I like to play lots of different styles so that in a way is one of my strengths and then um, having been a teacher for so long um, I, I I like to try and get that over to students you know so to be able to teach students how to play the the really important things for making a great drummer and so that's part of what I've been doing but um, along the way I try to learn improve and you know you're always surrounded by people who are better than you so it's a really good opportunity to learn but um, oh yeah I've just basically stumbled upon things and gone from one gig to the next and uh, I've messed up a few uh, you know uh, and, yeah, and learned I don't believe uh, yeah that. And, and you know <laughs> learn we all learn along the way but that's the journey's the fun part as well you know what it's like and also being a musician being involved in music is an incredibly wonderful thing whether it's professional or not it's a social activity We meet fantastic people. It's a very supportive community, particularly the drum world. I love the drum community. It's it's gorgeous. So um, that's a very nice thing to be involved in. So, yeah, yeah. Let's let's go a little bit back. So, so you you told us you started with 12 on the drum set. That's right. And when was the switch to the classical percussion, or what was the decision for that? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I went to a teacher, a fantastic teacher called Brian Booth, and he's he's taught quite a, a few different guys over the years. He's still around and he's a fantastic guy. And he said to me, look, um, yeah, you can learn drums. This is all good. <clears throat> but he said, I suggest you you learn classical as well. You learn drums, but you you learn timpani, you learn tune percussion because you're young enough, you can do it. 
And I said, yeah, okay, great. You know, I, I was 12, I didn't know anything. I just did what he said. And he taught me that, which was great. It was wonderful. And then when I got to 16, 17 years old, I decided that I wanted to study at college, but there was only one place you could study drum set in the UK in 1982. And that was in Leeds in the north of England, which is a really excellent course. Um, I've been up there and done a masterclass and know the guys teach there and stuff and it's fantastic. But I was already lucky enough to be working back then so um, a professional friend of mine said to me, look, you're probably better staying in London. And in London, you could only do classical. Uh, there was no, well, one course had started, which was at the Guildhall where I studied, but it was a postgraduate course. So it was a jazz course. I think it was one year postgrad. And I couldn't do that because I, I hadn't been to college. So I started there, uh, I decided, well, I'm going to do classical. I shedded my scales and arpeggios very hard um, in a period of about three months, which was quite unpleasant. But um, anyway, there's nothing like a bit of pressure and a deadline to make you do some work, is there? Um, I learned all of that stuff, learned the pieces and auditioned for colleges. And um, I went to a fantastic teacher uh, called Alan Cumberland. Uh, who was, uh, he was the timpanist in the London Philharmonic at the time, he was teaching me timps. And then I got a place at the Guildhall, which I was uh, really happy about, because the Guildhall was, back then was a very, uh, a little more progressive than the other colleges in terms of the music that they they liked. And um, it's, well, they've all become progressive now, but um, it's, uh, I teach there now, it's a very uh, good open place. And so, I didn't tell them that I was into drums, but uh, they kind of realised after a while and then they were very open to that as long as I took the classical seriously, which I did. I, and I loved it. And funnily enough, one of my one of my old teachers, David Corkill, he was the timp is the timpanist in the English Chamber Orchestra. He was the principal percussion in the Philharmonia Orchestra. He, he sort of showed Benjamin Britten how to write percussion parts and stuff. I mean, Whoa. the guy's an absolute living legend. He's yeah. still at the Guildhall and I still see him when I go in and teach, which is absolutely incredible. Frighteningly, he doesn't look any older, but I do. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah, it was it was it was uh, one of those things that um, uh, it was what was available. And um, when I went there, I really loved it because we got classical snare drum lessons. That was challenging and great. They got us into some really great rudiments. We all launched ourselves into the Charlie Wilcoxons. We were doing timpani, playing Beethoven symphonies on the timps. And then we were playing tune percussion too. It was definitely my weakest uh, uh, area. I wasn't a very good reader on tune, but I sort of stumbled through it. And we used to do formalic vibe studies and stuff. And it's, it's, it's really, really good for you. I enjoyed it. So that's what I did. Funnily enough, I bumped into Peter Erskine. He came to the Royal College where I also teach and did a masterclass for us. He was absolutely amazing, obviously goes without saying. And then I said to him, we were having a drink after I said to him, but you studied classical, didn't you? He said, oh yeah. He said that there was, you couldn't do anything else back then. So it was kind of a bit like that. <laughs> That was it, but it was great. You know, I loved it. Uh, we, we talked about versatility, um, but how did you develop your versatility? Did you look for the right teachers or did you just listen to the music? What was your uh, tactic? Um, well, I, I, another great question. Um, it wasn't something that I worked out, funnily enough. Um, I think my first teacher influenced me in the sense that he said, look, uh, it's good to study classical. I agree with that. It is good. But we're in a specialist's world these days, but there is room for people who can do everything. Uh, not everything, but there, you know, a lot of the greats out there, such as Steve Gadd, Vinny, Dave Weckl, Greg Bissonette. Um, There are a lot of guys out there who can play a lot of different styles of music. Well, I mean, all the jazz cats can do different stuff as well. And, um, you know, everyone's super, ver super uh, skilled these days. But the versatility with me just came because 
I like lots of different music. So I started off getting into sort of, I was playing in a band. It was a bit like Blood, Sweat and Tears. It was sort of funky with horns. I loved that. Then I started, I just discovered Steve Gadd. Never been the same since, obviously. Still as still as dumbfounded by his drumming and now as I was then, couldn't believe it. I was picking up the needle, moving it back. I'm like, what the hell is that, you know? And um, uh, uh, and then I got into funk. I was listening to Tom Scott and then uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. I discovered Tower of Power, Chick Corea. And then I sort of fell down a jazz rabbit hole, which uh, I've never come out of that one either. <clears throat> and so on. So um, uh, while studying classical music, which I, I love, um, I'm into, you know, everything. I mean, I can be as enthusiastic at, uh, at listening to uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers record or a fantastic um, Nirvana. I mean, anything, honestly, to be honest, anything, even anything that's good. Uh, I, I just like it. So I think that led me towards that versatility whereas I do have students and I meet people and they say you know what is what do I do and I just say look follow your heart do what you love to do because what you love to do will lead you to you being amazing at that if you don't like playing jazz or you're not interested in it you don't have to do it it's okay um, or if you don't want to play rock rock and roll that's okay just go where you feel. But with me, I had such a wide set of taste that I in genuinely enjoy everything, <coughs> excuse me, everything. Um, and, and that led me to being uh, versatile, I suppose. And you played everything in the last couple of years and you played everything with the greatest artists in those musical directions. Let's, let's do a little bit name dropping right here. Uh, you played uh, rock with David Gilmore or Mick Jagger. You played pop with George Michael or Annie Lennox. You played soul and R&B with Otis Redding or Ray Charles. And you played with jazz greats such as Art Farmer or Wynton Marsalis and more and everything in between. It's unbelievable. Real, it's really unbelievable. Um, what experiences have you gained from these collaborations? And is there a particular collaboration that has stuck in your memory? Well, a lot of the people that I've worked with, um, because I, I, I spent my whole life really being a session drummer, a studio player, quite often some of the guys that I've played with have just been like on one occasion where we made one recording. Uh, some of the guys I've worked with, I've been in their bands for years, um, so there's a difference. Um, but... Um, Probably, I would say that, what have I learned from it? Um, being around great artists, um, in fact, being around anybody, I always take as a learning experience. Even if I see a drummer, I don't really like his playing, his or her playing, but I will take that as a learning experience. Um, I normally enjoy most things, but, um, you know, uh, if I see something, uh, I did go and see a, a gig not so long ago and um, I really didn't enjoy it. You know, my friends enjoyed it and they were like, oh, how was it? I was like, well, I, I didn't like it, but, um, you know, this this artist has got good guitar technique. She's a good singer. Uh, I don't dig her, but, um, you know, uh, that's okay. You don't have to like everything. But um, being around great artists is a real privilege, I think. Um, and most of them have got something to offer, even if they don't realise it. And I watch them really closely and I listen to them really closely and I try and find out what they want and I try and give them what they want. So that's what I've learnt um, because... When you're playing with someone as a side man, it's important to um, understand what the music needs um, and um, try and give the right thing. Um, funnily enough, I was I was quoting this recently, but a few months ago, a couple of months ago, I did a, a session for Graham Goldman, the guy from 10cc uh one of the main guys from 10cc uh, i've done a few things with him recently 
and he called me up and we had a little chat he said look I've got this track um can you do it for me um I said yeah of course you know I, I'd love to and uh, he said look but um you don't uh if you don't really feel it um you know don't feel that you've got to do it if you don't really want to play it which is like an incredibly humble thing for someone like that to say not like I want this I want that he's He's opening up to what I've got to offer, which is really great. And probably, like, to answer your question specifically, Timo, in the sense that um, uh, uh, it's quite a long time ago when I was in Van Morrison's band, but because I was around him for such a long time, I got to know him and, and take away a lot from him because he taught me a lot. And some of the things that he taught me, I can apply to everyone one of the things he's really into is is the spontaneity of the first time you play a piece of music what we call first take syndrome but he doesn't just apply that to the studio he applies that to everything so he doesn't really like to play a piece of music twice in one day uh, whether it's in the studio or whether it's live so on the sound check didn't really like to sound check them um, and that's not because he's being difficult although some people would accuse him of that uh it's just because he has an incredibly deep feel for the music and he listens and understands to what guys are playing and he wants your first reaction to the music which is why many of his recordings are heroically played by fantastic musicians who are making loads of mistakes and those mistakes go on the record uh, he doesn't mind that at all because what you're experiencing is like this is the first time these guys have actually played this music and they don't even know the chords. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but that's true. <laughs> so I took that from him. That's one of the things I really took from Van is is um, understanding and respecting like the first take um syndrome and then trying to get yourself into that mentality whereas you you're not working music out intellectually all the time you just let your heart and your feel for the music do whatever do what is right which when you're learning at the beginning is quite difficult to do but um once you once you've got you know a, half a dozen fills down uh, you know, digadum or ringgun digadum. Uh, that's going to get you through. I don't know, like thirty or forty percent of anything in a straight eights feel, uh, for instance. So then, uh, you know, people are saying like, "What fills are you going to play there?" And I'm like, "Look, if I try and work a fill out, it's never going to come out right." I try to get to the stage where I've got a little vocabulary of fills, and then something just pops out. That's a way better way of doing it so that's um, spontaneity um, respect for the music understanding the music understanding the history of the music playing in a really authentic stylistic way playing styles authentically that to me is challenging it's something that i've taken from different artists um probably another little lesson i got i do quote this to students because this is a funny uh, it's a funny name drop, but it's a, it's a true moment in my career, was, which was uh, I did a gig, which is on YouTube, actually, um, tribute to Burt Bacharach and Hal David at the Albert Hall in London. Lots of guests. It's a beautiful gig, actually. I love doing it. It's one of my favourites. It's quite a long time ago. I actually had hair back then, so you may not recognise me. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, um, and Burt Bacharach, totally straight faced, um, said to me, I suppose, I don't know, I was in my sort of uh, mid 30s then, said to me, um, Ralph, uh, I just, are, are you accenting the eighth notes on the hi hat? And I said, I said, yes, I am. He said, okay, great. He said, look, can you, can you do something? Can you play all the eighth notes even with no accents, please? I said, sure, absolutely. And we played the group. I said, what, like this? And I was just, I was probably going before. And he said, uh, he said, like, no accent at all. I said, what, like, he said, yeah, exactly. That's what I want. And I played the group. And he said, I want that on everything. That's cool. Yeah. And I, I, I did it. 
I was just used to accenting very slightly on the beat, not much, you know, and um, I did it. And then in the sort of coming months after that, I went away and, and I started thinking about it. And I realised that um, most, in my opinion anyway, most uh, straight eighth music doesn't need any accents on the hi-hat. That is the same as speaking too loudly or typing in capitals. You don't need to accent the hats because you've got two really big accents in the bar. The, the bass drum and the snare drum, they are big. So the hats don't need to do that unless you want to really underline something or you're pumping some, some rock. But, you know, a few times before that happened to me, um, people would say to me in the studio sometimes, oh yeah, um, can we have a can't hear we can't hear the in-between eighth notes. We can only hear the accents. It's a bit like a click track. Um, I always like all the clicks the same volume because if, if, if beat one is accented, then if I set that at the right volume for me, I've got that good and these other three are too quiet. Or if I set these three at the right volume, these are right and that one's too loud. So it's a relative thing, but that is something I learned from someone else. It happened um, and I took that away with me and I've, I've never, I've never really, uh, I've never gone back to accenting stuff unless I really want, unless I want to. So I was doing something without thinking about it. And now I think about it. So that's, that's another one of the things that I took away from some great artists. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, so you learn from artists and you learn from the studio work. Um, yeah. Can you tell us yeah, oh, what definitely. are the challenges? Yeah, of and that's studio that's what I do with my students. And, um, how when I first um, went into started to do so some of my do first you sessions, uh, I don't know. I I was in my kind of uh, late twenties really when I was doing sort that's of proper session like when people called me in to play on albums. And I remember one time I went to a studio in London. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you can edit that one out. I went into a studio in London called Roundhouse Studios and there was a session band in there, all really seasoned studio players. And, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and we, played, we played some takes and um, I thought to myself, it sounds like everybody's slowing down. It's weird. Uh, and I thought about that for a very short time and then I realized it's like, oh yeah, no one is slowing down, <clears throat> but I am speeding up badly. It's like, oh shit, you, you have really got to get yourself sorted out. You know, I, I, that was like a real light bulb moment. So sort of, it's great question preparing yourself for the studio, but I, I think of preparing yourself for the studio as the same as preparing yourself for everything. The skill set to me is the same. It's just in the studio, it's enforced heavily. You cannot get away without playing really good timing. So the first thing I do with all my students is to get them to improve their own timing. So what I always say is, if you're practicing with a, a metronome or a click, you're getting better. If you're practicing without a metronome or a click, you're getting worse. So you're better off not practicing than, pra uh, than practicing without a click. That's, that's one of my things because the, the metronome, the click, uh, will strengthen your internal time feel. You know this, of course. But um, it's really important and I see it because I teach college students, they come in, they're all wibbly wobbly like a jellyfish and I want to get them into a sumo wrestler. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I try and strengthen that. And, and you, the thing is, everybody can do this. It's not like something that just comes down. It's not like just a God-given uh, talent and there's nothing you can do with it. All of this can and is developed. So learning how to play great time and developing your internal time feel <clears throat> is probably the biggest thing that would, I would say, not only prepare, but it will, it will get you through 
every musical situation in a fantastic way. Whether you're playing with a click or not, um, whatever music you're playing, whether it's jazz, it's like people say, oh, you can't play jazz with a click, which is untrue because we, we do loads of it and uh, it sounds fine. Practice that. And, um, and then it, when you play with people and you're not playing with a click track, it's perfectly okay to uh, speed up, slow down, if you want, or if, if the vibe happens. Uh, there are loads of great recordings. One of my favorite recordings uh, that I sometimes play to students when they say, oh no, everything everything has to be metronomic. I say, well, here's a recording of Brian Blade playing with the Warner Jams band, Brad Meldow, uh, no, uh, uh, different guys on, um, uh, Larry Golding's on Hammond, Brian, and it's killing it's so swinging you listen to it and then by the time you get to the end of the track you spin back and it's like it's much much faster well who cares it doesn't matter because the feel is most important but the feel is most important much more important no one is gonna put like the band or the uh you know uh take any great that like the meters and say, oh yeah, but they're not they're not relative time, they're not to a click. That's irrelevant. Nobody cares about that. But practicing to a click will strengthen your feel and make you a better drummer. And that's what I believe in. So that's probably like the biggest thing that I would say gives you that um it not prepares, but puts you into a really great uh um, will improve the way you sound the way you interact with other musicians and your understanding of how the music works. Do you have a good advice um, for students? Because I totally agree with you. And, but what I sometimes notice, especially with students, after a while, they can't play without a click anymore. <laughs> You, you you know what you you know you know what I mean. Of course, I know all these play gaps in between the clicks, but maybe you have because you're such an experienced player. Um, what can you do to improve your internal timing? Because when you play to a click, it's fine. If I turn off the click, they totally struggled. Yeah. Well, you know what? I love that question. Um, the answer is. Uh, in my experience, I don't I don't really think that goes away because I think it's hard for the human mind to um, be like computer accurate with stuff. You know, our 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 body is complicated. And if I'll, an example I'll give is you've all done this, but like we rehearse a gig and everything is exactly set to tempo. All the tempos are just right, it's fantastic, it's lovely. Everyone's cool, it's grooving, we're happy. We go and do the gig and everyone gets an adrenaline shot before the gig. They walk on and then we metronome all the tempos and all the tempos are absolutely perfect. And people come off and they go, man, um, everything felt really slow. <laughs> So that's one example. And honestly, uh, Dirk, I, 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 I still find that sometimes I can't, I don't know where, where I am with a tempo. I need help, uh, which is why I do rely on a metronome in the sense that sometimes, well, I nearly always use it to count in songs because then that is, something that you just don't have to worry about point one and then also sometimes i just vi i just leave it on visually so quite often i use it if i don't want to play to metronome and my last gig the water boys like we weren't really playing to metronome unless we needed a unless we needed it that was the way the the band was it was organic but i i i do like to see it because even though I've been doing this all my life, I, I can rush and I can drag. And so uh, that's okay, we're human. So uh, I have been addicted to the click, for sure. And I love playing to the click now. And if it's like you take it away from me, it's like, oh, someone's taken away my toy. I, I, I get that, uh, I get that myself now. So I think the way to do that is to probably just say, don't worry 
um, because it's not a criminal offence to speed up or slow down. Everybody does it together. And then if you do that, then it's easier to just relax, make music. If you, if you really need to keep it quite honest with the tempo, then maybe just look at the tempo. You are, it's like, whoa, actually, yeah, I'm gonna be getting a bit excited here. Or sometimes what I do is I just, I, 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 I normally have at least a small mixer or a, a bigger mixer if I'm on tour. And I always have a mute, bu mute button with the metronome. So I just mute the metronome channel or I pop it in just to see where I am. And that's a good training method. Uh, it doesn't indig and then you know where you are, you know, because as a whole with washing line, with this, um, I don't know what you call this in German, but anyway, you know what I mean. This is where we hang out our washing. We are the line. The rest of the band is the washing. <laughs> so they need to rely on us um, to be solid. Not like a machine, but we need, you know, if everything, if you put every beat on the end of the beat, then that becomes the beat. So you've got to have the beat and then everyone else can hang off. It's fine. And um, we're not going to move around too much. We need to be quite strong. And especially for, you know, most modern music, the drummer is a good person to impose quite strongly a, a, a strong metronomic feel. And I think if you practice that and work on it, then you can really improve your time playing and you improve the sound of the band, particularly the evenness of the eighth notes. That's one thing that I'm quite, you know, I'm keen on. I always say the eighth notes, each eighth note is like um, one of those wooden blocks that um, like kids, toddlers play with, like you fit them all together. The next beat is another block, it's touching. You can't have the next beat until it's time for the next beat. So being aware of all those eighth notes being even is super, super important. I have one more question regarding the uh, work in a studio yeah. session. Um, how did you deal with critics from the producer or from the artist? If you say, okay, I don't like this, Phil, please play another one. Or I want, I hear this and that in my mind, please play that. Um, how much pressure did you feel and uh, yeah how did you handle those situations that's that, another great question um i i i i suppose i'm lucky that i'm quite confident um but not in an arrogant manner i don't i don't i don't try to impose uh, i i i sorry i'll try and put this clearly i don't try to predetermine something and then impose it on the music. There are drummers who do that. I really don't like this. I think the music needs something. And when you're making the music for the first time, it's very difficult to tune in to what the music do. So I'm always giving a, a viewpoint on what, what the music needs, which is, It means I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve. Uh, I'm vulnerable. Um, it, it, I'm only giving ideas. Now, producers have ideas. Some producers will put a demo, make a demo, fall in love with the demo. Then they'll book me and then they'll get me to come and reproduce the demo. <laughs> This is... Um, it depends whether the demo is, is what's needed or whether we as drummers can give great things to the music, extra things that the producer or the artist did not think about. I like to think that we have a, a really good sense of what the music needs. So I try and give that, if the producer or the artist doesn't like that or they're feeling or they want something else, I am totally cool with that. I'm not, I'm not married to any of my ideas. And I have been, um, I've always been like that because I don't know, I wouldn't say I've been schooled on it, but um, there have been a couple of times when I've been in the studio and uh, the artist uh, has wanted something. And I respect that because they're the guys who are employing me. And if they want something, they get it. Even if I disagree with it. Um, and there have been a few times 
when I thought, well, I don't like this idea. A long time ago, I was doing um, a track with Graham Lyle from Gallagher and Lyle. Fantastic, amazing musician. I was in the studio with him and Hamish Stewart, my buddy from the Average White Band, who's an absolutely wonderful artist as well. We were doing something and then we played a track. I loved it. I thought the um, version was good. And Graham said, um, yeah, this is, this is great, but I really think this needs a hi-hat on the and of each beat. And I looked at him and I thought, and I'd really thought about it, and I thought, well, I don't think that. I don't agree with it either, but anyway, uh, we're working together and you're hearing it. You're Graham Lyle, I'm just a, I'm just a drummer. So um, I said, okay, great, okay, well, let's let's try that. And I thought, no, this is a really bad idea, you know, forget it. So I went in and I overdubbed hi hat. I think it was I think it was foot uh, on each beat on the end of each beat. And as soon as I put that on the track, the track just came alive. This is what working with a great artist can be. So I never try and impose something if they don't like it. I try and make it happen. Um, if they're critical, you know, I have I have had a couple of people who've they can be difficult, hard taskmasters, but, uh, you know, I'm, uh, we're all grown-ups around here. You know, um, we can be replaced. Um, I've seen other people talk about that. I'm sure I've been replaced, and I know that I have replaced other people. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. I think Andy Newmark was saying that uh, recently. It just doesn't matter. You're going to get replaced and then you might end up replacing somebody. It's just the way the wind's blowing that day. Maybe the engineer didn't get the sound or maybe maybe they came up with an idea. They told you this idea. You played it. And then afterwards they thought, no, that's no good. They said, and then they would go, OK, you know, we'll get someone else to do it. Or, or let's just do something completely different with you. So all of those things can happen. And... Um, it's not that big a deal that the music is much more important than um, what you think. Uh, it, you know, we, we're just helping the music to happen. And the more we can do that and, and put our hands up and say, yeah, we're human, we're fallible, things can go wrong, the better. Cool. Is that, does that make sense? That makes totally sense. Totally yes. sense. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so you you did a lot of studio work and um, live tours. Uh, how do you or do you make differences between a studio session and your a live tour in the in what or how you play? The uh, the basic answer to that is not really. But when you're playing live, um, you've got a lot more freedom. Um, so. And also, probably the biggest thing is, if you are playing in big venues uh, and you've got a very big PA system uh, and you're being amplified and the band is coming through the PA system, when you hit the bass drum or snare drum, it, it's huge. It's really, really huge. So that will affect the way that you can approach stuff because... It's very difficult for smaller things to come across on things like that. Um, I suppose it's just the size of the PA system, the size of the venue and the way air moves. I think when you're playing bigger stuff, um, you have to play simpler. Um, but really, um, live, what I like about live is, uh, and I like this in the studio too, but there's um, a great enjoyment to be had from the danger and the possibility that anything could happen and I love it when stuff does happen you know like um, Van would often stop the band just stop the band no 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 right stop okay we'll do another tune now it's like oh what did he just do there it's like well he does it because he can do that um, Mike Scott and the Waterboys same thing you know we'd play an introduction or something and he'd go um, stop All right, like in front of the audience. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, that that was way too fast. Uh, let's do. Let's try that a bit slower at the right tempo, or something like that. 
and um, these little things that happen like or something will just like drop into a reggae outro for 15 minutes or or some crazy shit will happen I, I love all of that stuff so being open to that is good is great for live it's fun it's spontaneous and involving the audience in that process is great to me as well I, I love that that's what I thrive on live a studio can be a bit you're in a room you're making a, it's like a sculpture sculpture you're making a painting or a sculpture it's it's different it's very dry you've got to think beyond those four walls whereas when you're in a room with people i don't care if it's a small bar or a, an arena it doesn't make any difference to me i love the interaction of bands audience they they encourage us we encourage them we want them to have a great time they want us to have a great time we want to have a good eat good gig and a, a memorable time and that's what live playing is all about it's like very uh spontaneity throughout all the music so just i try and enjoy that as much as i can and if something crazy happens then then i just embrace it and go yeah this is great yeah let's just do that wait stop let's do this okay right what do you think ladies and gentlemen right let's do it boom <laughs> it's like we can do it we can do anything we want and then it's good fun that's great in addition to all your work as a live and studio drummer, you also work, as we heard, as a professor and private teacher. Um, how has teaching influenced your own understanding of music and what are important qualities that a good teacher should have? Well, it, I've learned so much from it. Um, I really have learned an incredible amount because when I first started teaching, I didn't know anything about it. And... Um, um, I don't know. I, I, I would say that I wasn't that good a teacher at the beginning. I just didn't have the understanding, but I could play. But now I've learned the things that I need to know. Um, it's, it's taught me the things that are important because I hear my students play and I, I try and listen to the way they play. And then I like to try and listen to I, I like to try and get them to listen to themselves by recording themselves. So they can hear themselves back and then improve straight away. So playing great timing, hearing that back, um, using recording as a way of improvement is something that I started off with because I used to teach at my studio for many years. And the students would listen to themselves and immediately say, hey, that's, uh, yeah, that's quite inconsistent. I say, yeah, what do you think of that? And they say, yeah, it's quite inconsistent. Um, the snare drum is not always the same volume. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Uh, the fills are a bit too much. Yeah, that's right. Okay, right. Well, that took 10 minutes. So go back. Let's correct all of these things. Um, consistency, consistency of dynamics, appropriate fills for the music. They do it one time after they've only heard it back one time. They come back and they're already 100% better. So learning that has been a, a big champion. Uh, I champion this technique, recording oneself to listen back. Not like endless gigs. I mean, I mean for study. It's something I know that Dave Weckl championed when he studied with Gary Chester on the new breed that was a long time ago but Gary Chester encouraged all of his stu uh, students to record themselves and I think there's a good reason for that he was a session drummer too and he understood it but it works so I've learned that and then um, just learning um, that some well firstly as we talked about you can improve everything uh, if you work at it great timing and so on and so forth technique rudiments listening to music understanding styles all of this can be worked on and improved massively with a little bit of effort not too much but reading same thing you can do it a lot of people say oh i can't do it it's like look look you can do it if you can learn a language uh, we're all doing that we've all done that you, you can learn to read music particularly on drums because it's it's a little bit simpler or it's a bit looser and so teaching has taught me that for sure um probably um 
One more thing was I used to allow my students to play, get, play anyway technically in order to get a result when I first started teaching. Now I say to them, look, if you do it this way, you are guaranteed 100% results. You cannot fail. So I believe in um, German grip on the hi-hat if you're playing crossed. Uh, I, I like the molar technique. I'm not slavish to it, but I studied it and I try and help people with that. I've, you know, that doesn't mean that some of my favorite drummers such as Steve Jordan or Nate Smith don't play French or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Final, the final... Um, result uh you you know know the rules then you can break them every single day but if you're playing um german grip you've got your fingers on the stick on the hi-hat that gives you a very uh easy wrist movement with no physical uh knock-on effects no negative physicality which you can get with french because your wrist doesn't easily move that way obviously we're playing jazz french uh because it's right there and you don't need arm f for jazz really so i like i like that and then if you're playing eighth notes on the hi-hat and, and you're only moving the wrist and you're saving the forearm for accents that means that you've got an extremely guaranteed extremely consistent eighth note groove before doing anything if you don't believe me, look at Steve Gadd, look at Vinnie Colliuta. I show students they're doing. doesn't mean that someone playing French on the hi-hat can't play uh, uh, evenly, but the thing is this is an easy way of playing evenly and it works for me. So if I get them to do that, I always find that it works. It tightens up. It tightens up the eighth note beat. And also your stick is not going far because it does not need to go far. It just stays there. And then if you need an accent, you don't, you just use the arm for the accent you go in it's fine so that's one of the things technically the other thing technically that i i i've learned over the years is that when people are learning how to play jazz they start when they're young and they play heel down on the hi-hats um i mean i'll i'll stick my neck out uh, it, it just doesn't work to me i i don't allow my students to do that why because they cannot play the hi-hats staccato enough or strongly enough to make that work so there are exceptions to that rule but you'll find very very few jazz drummers playing with the heel down unless it's extremely extremely quiet because even on a ballad it must be staccatissimo as they say in italian very staccato very tight and also in jazz this is the center of the grooves very important so that's another thing that i've learned i used to let my students get away with that i regret that now but Fortunately, for about the last 20 years, I've been teaching them how to play heel up. It works for me. Um, I show them videos of the greats, such as Peter Erskine, or anyone for that matter, playing heel up. Mostly, uh, it gives you a really great result immediately, and it doesn't take long to learn. So that's, that's another little technical thing that I've learned from uh, teaching all these years. Teaching all these years. We are very lucky that you will be teaching in Germany this summer at the Gage of Crumb Camp um, and sharing your knowledge. Uh, can you already say what you will be focusing on in your workshop there? Yep. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I'm very lucky to be coming over. I'm really excited just because we're going to be hanging out and there's going to be a fantastic vibe. And um, that's the main thing is just sort of being around people who are into playing the drums and 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 enjoying themselves because having fun is the most important thing to me working on stuff I, I like I like to just you know as I say to all my students I like to help people um, I'm not some sort of great dude who's got amazing stuff that uh, you know you might be lucky to get from me it's not like that I'm a drummer I'm on a journey and um, I teach and I try and help everybody that I come into contact with so some of the things I like to work on are the things we've been talking about like how to really improve your time and make yourself sound better and feel better on the drums which immediately brings you lots more friends uh, music musician friends they're like hey you know what I always if I improve or I play well or I've done something you know people say hey man you're you're sounding great you know they people notice it um, so timing 
techniques with different things. I mean, I love teaching how to play jazz. Uh, I, I've got a really good uh, learning to play jazz hack, which is fantastic. Uh, I think it's great anyway, but uh, it, it, it certainly it works. Um, and then um, uh, reading. I love helping to people people to get people. I love helping people to if they're not readers to start that process uh, gently, easily uh, to just get going and break through the glass ceiling of, oh, I'm, ne I'm never going to be able to do that. Well, you can do it and I, I can show people how to do that. And then just having a, having a great time on the drums, how to relax, how to play a good pocket, how to hit the snare, uh, how to balance, um, or, or just general playing skills, uh, which come from being together in a, in a learning situation like this, being together, uh, being friends and having fun. And that way you can improve, be creative and have a great experience. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. Great. Um, you, you were just um, talking about reading. And I think this is something where a lot of drummers are kind of afraid what you just said. Do you have a way how to teach or how to teach sight reading skills? Because I mean, you're a drummer when you, I mean, it's not that often in, in our days anymore, but in the past it was really huge. And how can you develop sight reading skills? Because for me, it's, it's very, I mean, I consider myself as a pretty good reader, but like, I've never played that much in a big band because there is no big band. So how it's it. Uh, so even if I'm a good reader, it's a totally different story to lead a big band. Uh, of course I can read the notes and I'm, I think I have a feel for it, but how, how can you improve your reading skills or what do you give your students on their way to improve reading for a band, not a, not a snare drum solo, but reading like sight reading a chart or whatever, or how do you develop your skills? Well, that, that is a fantastic point because what you're going into here is the next level from just reading a single line. So the first level is learn how to read those those rhythms on a single line. You can just tap them on your knee, clap them, whatever you want. So you can do that. You do have to do that to recognize what the rhythm is. But as they say, um, how many, you know, it's, uh, it's one of these things you can look up, but um, they say like, you know, in the average um, copy of the New York Times, how many English words, how many different English words are there in, in one copy of the New York Times? It's very interesting. I don't know if you know this answer, but the answer is, uh, what do you think? I don't know. What do you think? How many words are there in like different words in one copy of the New York Times? I have no idea. Uh, okay, I would. Okay, I say just two thousand. Two thousand. Exactly, that is what it is. It's two thousand. <laughs> yes. Wow. Shabbo. Yeah, I know. Brilliant. Exactly. The thing about it is right. Now that's a pretty serious paper, right? They're they're talking with some great vocab. That is not so many words. This is the New York Times, right? This is uh, you know not the. Not the National Enquirer as they have in the States or where we have the Sun newspaper in the UK. Uh, the vocab is a little more basic, but, the, you know, so the thing is, same with with music. Um, there is, and particularly big band, which I love talking about, love playing. There is a limited amount of vocabulary out there uh, that you need to get to know. So it's two levels. First thing is you must must learn the actual basic rhythms, like learning your basic word, that's like learning the words. And then, then you learn how to apply the rhythms to different styles and orchestrate them. And the orchestration is the key thing. So with, if we're talking about just big bands, if you, um, if you've got a phrase, say you've got like one, two, three, four, one, ba, ba, ba. Okay, there's that phrase. So it comes, you've got to rest on one. You've got a staccato um, quarter note crotchet on two. And then you've got a, a, dot, a dotted crotchet on three. 
and you've got a, a quaver on and of four. I don't know what you call these notes in, in German, actually. Viertel. Yeah, yeah. Blimey, yeah, I'm really sorry. I don't know those. We did have to learn um, a few German percussion terms at college, you know, like Schlagzeug, um, uh, Palken, um, Piatti, uh, uh, a Kleiner Trommel and all of that. But that's all I know. Sorry. It, OK, but everyone understands. Uh, do people understand like um, quarter notes or do they understand crotchets? Quarter notes is best. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so. You've got one, two, three, four, one, but, but, but. Right, so the, the first way to do that is to put that in the groove if we're playing jazz. We'll play some time, ding, 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 and so on. Then we're going to play one, ga, 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 just on the snare, nothing else, right? So the next thing would be, let's play it on the bass drum, ding, 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 boom, boom, ding, boom. Okay, no big deal. Then let's orchestrate it between the two things, bass drum and snare drum. We always usually want to keep the groove going as much as we can. So ding, 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 ga, boo, ga. Okay, and then let's do it the other way. One, boo, ga, boo. All right. So we've got that. That's good. Now, uh, that might be cool, might be the trombones. Um, or maybe there's a long note at the end and uh, it, it would be boo ba bow so we could go ding 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 boo ga boosh and we'll crash the ride that's another orchestration choice so even without going anywhere off the the ride symbol we have the time we have the crash whenever we want and we're crashing the ride the whole time why because it's right there you don't have to go anywhere and then it interrupts the groove least. Okay, then the next thing is, um, it's a bigger phrase, what, ba, 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 like trumpets, trombones, and the whole band are in. So we can play them strong, stronger. We can play them, but we might want to set the band up and do a setup. So one, two, three, four, ba, that would be the simplest setup you can get. If you want to hear simple setups, listen to the guy who played on most of the Sinatra records, Irv Kotler, amazing drummer. He's famous for just hitting one beat, bap. So you would go one, two, three, four, gap, boom, gat, goosh. That's your most basic setup. Then maybe you might say, okay, let's play like um, uh, a rough one, two, three, four, ra, go, gat, go. Or let's play a triplet into that. One, two, three, four. Do, do, ga, go, ga. All right, there's another one. All right, um, here's another one. We want to do a little bit of a comedy setup, for instance. One, two, three. Go, do, bo, ga, ga. But, you know, ooh, ooh, there's always a bit of fun going on with jazz and big band. Uh, a lot of it is a little bit comedy or pastiche, you know. One, two, three. Go, do, go, ba, you know. And then um, you could do like a little Count Basie build up. One, two, boom, but, boom. So, boosh, ga, boosh. So that's like the ride and the bass drum, the cymbal still going, and then the snare on the second one, and the last one could be the ride cymbal crash or a crash. Um, that's like one simple way of just getting into some orchestrations. Yeah, yeah. And then the way you're going to learn that, there are a couple of books that show it. Um, but really, the best way is to go straight back to the music. It's very easy if you listen to like two drummers. Uh, if you say like, right, who do I listen to? Uh, you, you can, you know, it's two or it's like 50. <laughs> Or, I don't know, two, four, or or 50. But, you know, um, really, Sonny Payne with the Count Basie Orchestra, who was like Buddy Rich's hero. Uh, everything he played, there's loads of video on there. If you put Count Basie Orchestra in 1962, there's an amazing gig in Sweden there. Uh, beautifully recorded, all covered. The whole stage is, is like a forest of Neumann microphones. Uh, I mean, it's... It's studio porn, that is. If nothing else, it, it sounds incredible. But uh, you can see what, uh, and hear very, very well what Sonny's doing. Then you've got Sinatra Live at the Sands with the Count Basie Orchestra conducted by Quincy Jones, very classic record. You can literally 
and you should do so, like write these things down and get those um and then other than that for big band then you can come on to mel lewis with the thad jones mel lewis jazz orchestra and then listen to what mel does which sometimes he plays more like a small band drummer he doesn't even set things up or he doesn't even make the phrases even um so he's not worried about it which is a great way of thinking about it like don't worry about it play some great swinging time and it's all going to sort itself out and then after a couple of times you think oh yeah that really needs something give it a bit of that with time so that's how i do it and uh, i don't think it's that complicated because once you've got about you probably ha need about like 20 things that's going to get you through 80 at 75 percent of all big band <laughs> it's much <laughs> more simple than we think Great. <laughs> I'm so thankful that you told uh, all that right now because <coughs> that is what Dirk and I uh, always tell our students. But if a living legend is uh, telling this, yeah. I it, wish. Has another, it has another impact on them, I hope. You're too kind. You're too kind. Oh, no. no, I mean, uh, like everybody knows it. It's sometimes getting the students to believe us. Um, But, you know, what I use as much as anything, I sure, I'm sure you do the same thing. You know, I do get students and they really don't believe me when I show them, uh, I tell them stuff. But then we have the, we, we're in the world of YouTube. And what mm. I do is I just say, look, don't take my word for it. Let's look at Sonny Payne doing this. Let's look at, let's look at Peter Erskine doing this. Let's look at Jeff Hamilton doing this. Uh, in fact, anyone anyone you want and it's all out there so that's a good good proof as well so uh that's the way i do it luckily we've got amazing resources now but yeah i think we all show the same thing we all know it and i, I think students sometimes they do struggle to believe that they're going to be able to do it but in fact if you spend a small amount of time doing it you can learn something really quickly and then once you've got that you've got that forever And that's that's nice to know. Totally great. <laughs> well, Ralph, you're not just a drummer. You're also a composer and a producer. You have your own studio. But with um, I have to look on the watch. <laughs> and we're now about one hour in. We, we just scratched the surface. Yeah. We could we, we could talk for hours. I'm sure. And I love um, it. <laughs> and um, yeah, your stories your great are, yeah. are so great. And yeah, thank you very much. Uh, but my last question for today: uh, Yeah, what what is uh, your what are your current projects, and what are your plans for the future? Oh, that's nice. Um, I'll have to think about that. Um, probably at the moment, I'm doing a few um, recording sessions. Uh, freelance recording sessions um recently i did that thing for graham goldman uh, i think he's got another record on the go which is great i'm really very um uh proud uh well, not proud but uh very um delighted uh honored to come and to play for someone like him he's a he's a monster musician uh i'm very humbled to play with someone like him that's that's been amazing um uh, i'm doing some freelance work in london so the other day i was in town doing a, a recording for the universal catalog uh of um the music of irving berlin uh we're recreating that we've done that really fantastic arrangement steve sidwell who was the guy that did the robbie williams um, swing when you're winning record and uh, he's an amazing arranger producer and we've been doing stuff for him so i've been doing that project which is, was great the other day is amazing big band we've we've also been doing some work for disney with him recreating some of the classic disney tunes which has been fantastic actually um actually it was one of the tunes that i had to do which was a phil collins song um And uh, I'm not sure what they do, but I think they take the vocal off or something. So and then they they just redo the tracks. I don't know how they do that. But anyway, one way or the other, um, it was it was nice to play different styles. Um, coming up, I have this fantastic drum camp, of course, which is um, definitely a beacon in my 
my diary. Uh, I'm really looking forward to doing this for the partly I was just saying to my son yesterday when I was playing in the Water Boys, I could never commit to doing engagements like this because I always had the loyalty to the band. This was my deal. And they were usually, uh, you know, if some guys like you said, oh, can you come and do a drum camp? I would have to say probably not because I don't know what I'm doing in August, you know. And then like when Stefan got in touch with me and was like, right, come and do a camp in August. And I say, well, yeah. I can do it. I'm free. It's in the book and I'm going to do it, which is going to be fantastic. So I'm really pleased to be doing this. A um, couple of other things I've got coming up. Um, I have a concert with one of my favourite jazz singers. He's an absolute beast of a singer. His name is Kurt Elling. Good German name there. Uh, Kurt. <laughs> Kurt Elling. Absolute monster jazz singer. I've played with him before. Um, we've got a concert uh, in Tbilisi in Georgia with an orchestra, which will be very interesting. Uh, I'm, I've yet to see what that's going to come out like, but uh, I know he's a monster. I'm really looking forward to that. So that's great. That's coming up. Um, and then um, probably just um, a little bit more freelance session work that uh, comes in. For instance, I've got a session in a couple of weeks' time. Well, I've actually got a session... Uh, oh, next, uh, I think it's next week. I never know what I'm doing here. No, it's this week, actually. It's <laughs> this week. Uh, uh, for a guy I've never met before, but anyway, it's a guy called Bruce Woolley, fantastic guy who co wrote Slave to the Rhythm. But oh, he okay. did like some work with Grace Jones, did a record with Grace, uh, with Sly and Robbie. Um, I'm very excited. In fact, right after this interview, I've got to call him. And then um, after that, the week after that, I'm doing a, um, a, some sessions for a project. I've worked with this guy before. He's an Italian megastar called Cesare Cremonini. Uh, a fantastic guy, he makes beautiful records. He's a really, really great artist. Uh, he's huge in Italy. And uh, I'm looking forward to that because he's he's one of those guys very specific. He asks for he wants a pitch on a snare drum. He asks for different things. He wants different stuff. You know, he's very interesting guys. Like, oh, yeah, this is nice, but I want a really high snare drum on that. OK, great. You know, uh, how about that? Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Now, can you play more busy on the hi-hats? Yes. You know, he knows exactly what he wants. So that's great. So that's coming up. Um, wow. And of course, my teaching, which carries on. Uh, I've got to get my kids, uh, as I call them. Oh, they're, I mean, they're amazing, my students. I'm really proud of them. They're all coming through college. Some of them are finishing off. They've got recitals to do. Um, you can see all of them on their Instas. I follow them. They they tag me and all the rest of it. So you can check out what they're doing. That's at Guildhall and the Royal College of Music. They're all absolutely fantastic musicians. And that's probably about it. Um, and then I'm definitely... Well, that's a lot. <laughs> well uh, I'm not crazy busy, not so crazy busy, but it's not bad. And then, and then one of the things that I'm going to start doing, because my hands are absolute mush at the moment, is uh, I'm getting my pad out, which uh, doesn't come out that much, but it, it really, really needs to. They're super, super spongy. I've got to get the pad out and I've got to start playing every day on that because um, when I get to you guys in August, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, this guy's nice, but he can't play. And I ah. don't <laughs> want that to happen. <laughs> Definitely not. I think, I think anyone else has to prove that he or she can play. So uh, <laughs> not you in first head. <laughs> Brilliant. <sighs> so the credit, the credit list is still growing. You need some more space on your uh, homepage. Uh, all important links uh, of Ralph in the show notes. And yeah, Ralph, thank you very, very much for taking the time to have a chat with us. Um, it was a pleasure and a real honor. And uh, we yeah. are really looking forward thank to you have uh, you here in Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Uh, I can't wait to um, meet you guys in the flesh on the course and um, get over there for some, for some well, just uh, uh, some drum hangings. <laughs> We're going to talk drums hard. Yeah. You're a fantastic, positive human being. Thank you so much that you take your time, uh, that you took your time for the interview.
Absolute Fantastic. pleasure. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.